All right, everybody. Well, happy July 4th weekend. I'm glad you guys were able to be here today. Um, If you have a Bible, go ahead and open up with us to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. This chapter is just almost overwhelming with the amount of stuff that is going on in this Mm -hmm. particular passage. And so I I have found this to be a challenging text over the years and uh, really enjoyed studying it this week to to prepare for this particular uh, message. But Revelation 13 is where we will be. Our goal is to cover the whole chapter. We will see. I mean, I think we can do it, but uh, we we will try to cover the whole chapter. Before we jump in today, uh, for those of you who were with us in the book of Daniel just a few months ago, uh, we won't read it right now, but if you remember Daniel chapter 7, uh, if you remember that sort of central chapter in the book of Daniel, you have this picture where Daniel is seeing these, these present and future empires of Babylon, uh, represented by the lion, and then Medo-Persia, the bear lifted on one side, and then Greece, which looks like a leper, and then there's a leopard, and then the fourth beast, which was terrifying and dreadful, had ten horns, which represented, we argued, it represents Rome and beyond. The, 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 uh, the, the uh, Rome and then the f- future governmental systems that will oppose God and His Word. And certainly, John is picking up on that imagery, no doubt, at the beginning of Revelation chapter 13. So, Greg, could you pray for us? Now, we're just going to take it in pieces as we try to yep. walk through it. Well, let's pray. Our Father, we thank You for another privilege to study Your Word together. And uh, Lord, we pray above all that this would prove fruitful in our lives, that we would know You and that we trust Your Word better, that we'd know how to better live in this world as followers of Jesus. Um, so, Lord, just help Mark and I right now to be very clear. Uh, Lord, help us explain things in a way that's understandable. And I pray, Lord, that we'd all leave with a better grasp of Your Word and who these two characters are that we see here in Revelation 13, this beast out of the sea and the beast from the earth, um, and how Satan works through them. Lord, I pray just for Your Spirit to give illumination and Lord, that we would truly see how applicable to our life right now uh, these things are. Uh, so Lord, we just commit our hearts and minds to you for these few moments, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Greg, could you read the first 10 verses, and then uh, we will get started? Yeah. Revelation chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast." And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for forty-two months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive to captivity, he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. So, uh, Greg, I want you to kind of jump in here uh, to start us off. Um, it, this, this beast clearly, I think, is be, uh, clearly referring to the Roman Empire at the time when John is writing. Uh, I think that's very clear both from Daniel and from mm-hmm. Revelation. But it obviously doesn't end with the death of Rome. No, no one would argue that the beast has now been done away with. Clearly, uh, Satan is always going to be using... Uh, totalitarian states, totalitarian governments to push back against God and His people. He's been doing that since Egypt, oppressing uh, Israel in, in the Exodus. 
He did it through the Assyrians oppressing Israel in the 700s BC. He did it through Babylon in the 500s BC. He did it through Persia. He did it through Greece. And then he does it through Rome. And he's done it through Hitler and Stalin and Mao Zedong and all these different uh, mm-hmm. leaders throughout church uh, history. And there we believe there will be a final climactic version of this right before the return of Christ. But uh, Greg, can you, can you uh, lead us into these first few verses? Yeah. Um, so we see verse 1, this beast rising out of the sea. Ten horns, seven heads, ten diadems on its horns, blasphemous names on its heads. Verse 2, the beast I saw was like a leopard, feet like a bear's, mouth like a lion's mouth. Um, and we'll, we'll stop there for a minute. I, I want to say um, at the outset again, I, we've mentioned this before, but this beast is the same beast talked about in chapter 11 who rises out of the abyss to make war on the saints and conquer them. We believe this is speaking of the Antichrist that John writes about the, uh, the man of lawlessness that Paul writes about is the little horn of Daniel 7. Um, it's the great end times opponent of God and his people. So that's who we're talking about here, this beast rising out of the sea. And now the sea also is something we need to think about. This is an important um, image in the book of Revelation. What does the sea represent? The sea represents the source of evil and chaos and destruction in the world. Everything bad comes out of the sea. Um, so it's not like literal waters. It's, it's metaphorical for humanity and its sin and rebellion against God. It's, you know, the domain of Satan. It's where he, the dragon comes out of the sea, the abyss, uh, the, the, the beast comes out of this. Now, the reason I mention those two together is in chapter 11, it actually talks about the beast who comes out of the abyss. But here he's coming out of the sea. And so in some ways, we need to see the abyss and the sea as synonyms, at least, if not talking about the same reality. Um, But so this is who this beast is. He comes out of this this source, this this swirling, turbulent source of evil, of chaos, of destruction. Let me just jump in there. That's why we see in the end of Revelation when it says, I saw new heavens and a new earth and the sea was no more. Mm -hmm. Clearly, this is symbolic language. The sea represents the place where all evil and human depravity comes from. That's where the beast comes from in Daniel Mm -hmm. and at the beginning of Revelation 13. When there's a new heavens and new earth, it doesn't mean there are going to be no bodies of water in the new creation. It's a way of saying the place from which human depravity, it's the source of human depravity, which is the sea in the book of Revelation. It will be done away with when God restores creation. Yeah, absolutely. And that's going to be such a wonderful thing. That will be good. Um, and so let's think about this beast here. Um, first, we see he, he's kind of a, a mixture of the beasts of Daniel 7. Mark already, already uh, mentioned that uh, in his opening comments. So, so we see similarities to the kingdoms of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and that fourth beast that was initially identified as Rome, but as I, I like that, Rome and beyond. Um, that's just a good way to think about it. Um, let's, let's look at some other things, though. So, well, actually before that, so he's going to be worse than all those together. He's kind of like got pieces of each one, like represent, you know, you can see some of, you know, what you saw in Babylon, you see that in this beast, some of uh, Medo-Persia you see in this beast, Greece, Rome, all that. You see all of that in this, this creature right here. And he's got 10 horns and seven heads. And on those heads are blasphemous names. And so I want to think about this, this phrase, that word blasphemous and blasphemous names, it comes up again in chat, uh, verse 5. He, he's given a mouth to utter haughty and blasphemous words. Verse 6, he opened, it's opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling. That word, uh, we need to understand what it is. We hear that all the time. We don't want to blaspheme. But what does that word actually mean? You know, if you're like me, it's, it's one of those things not growing up in the church You know, I knew it was an important word and I knew it was a bad word. We don't want to blaspheme God. We don't want to, you know, speak blasphemy. Bad thing. What does it actually mean? Blasphemy here is speech that denigrates or defames. It's literally slanderous speech toward God and his people. Um, It's speaking evil. It's degrading God and his people. Um, We see that in verse 5 and 6 as well here in uh, verse 1. And that's what marks this beast, is blasphemy. Like that's what's on his, the names that are written on his head that identify him. He's marked by speaking evil against God, by slandering God and God's people. Um, Thoughts? Yeah, just going with what you're saying there, the fact that 
he, John is describing one beast, and he uses the characteristics. Okay, now not, not all of you were in Daniel, so just to hang with me here. In Daniel, he describes those four different empires with four different metaphors. Here he describes this one beast with all four metaphors, which means we're not just talking about Rome. We're talking about some conglomeration of all fallen world systems. That's the idea. He's putting them all together in one, and that's why Rome was one example of it, but it continues all the way up until the end. I think that's an important point uh, to, to lay out here. Yeah, so verse 2 again, you've got those images, and then look at the second half of verse 2. This is what's significant. And to it, to this beast, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. So this creature, this beast, receives his power, his rule, and his authority from Satan himself. He is a satanic beast. Everything this beast does, he does because Satan is empowering him to do it, leading him to do it. Whatever he does is a reflection of Satan himself, of the dragon. Um, and so what we see here, look at, hold your place. I want you to look at um, chapter 2, verse 9. This was, this was interesting. Um, in his letter to the church at Smyrna, uh, John says this, Jesus through John says this. He says, I know your tribulation and poverty, your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander. Now, that word slander in the ESV is actually the word blasphemy in Greek. So it's the same word that we're reading about in chapter 13, okay? Um, I know the blasphemy of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a what? Synagogue of Satan. Um, that is absolutely crucial here because we, we see, one, the interconnectedness of the book of Revelation in this. What we saw in the letters in chapter 2 is being fleshed out a little more in uh, chapter, chapter 13. Yeah, and just jumping in here. So remember we talked about Jesus at Christmas, his birth in Bethlehem. Satan, we're told in Revelation 12, he was like a dragon trying to devour the baby when he was born. That's a graphic way of describing Satan the dragon trying to kill Jesus at the moment of his birth. But Satan doesn't do it directly. It's not like Mary gives birth right there, you know, and you got Jesus laying in a manger and the dragon shows up. That's not what happens. Satan doesn't work directly. He works through means. Mm -hmm. And the means he uses oftentimes is, is perverse authority. Who does he use? He uses the state. Who's the one in control? Herod, King Herod. So Satan is behind Herod. And what does he inspire Herod to do? Kill Jesus. So what you see is the dragon is behind the beast and the beast manifests itself in ungodly worldly powers. And so Satan stands behind. Now listen, I'm not saying all governments are wicked. I'm not saying all politicians are not Christians. Of course, that's not what we're saying. Romans 13 says the government is good if it does what it is called by God to do. Romans 13 says the government was given uh, the authority of the sword, which means God has empowered the government to punish evil and to reward what is good. That's what the government is there to do. The problem is, very often, governments start to punish what is good, and they start to reward what is evil, right? And so Satan, the, the dragon, is behind Herod, and also Satan was behind Pharaoh, trying to have Moses and the babies killed. Satan, the dragon, was behind that, but he uses perverse, godless uh, state government uh, situations to, to try to bring about his will, and that's what we're seeing here in, in Revelation 13. All right, um, let's move on then to, to verse 3. Again, we've got to try to make some progress. Um, it says, one of its heads seemed to have, had, seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. Now, I, I, think, I think we can make a good case that this mortal wound here was the wound inflicted by Christ at his cross, resurrection, and ascension, which is an initial fulfillment of the promise in Genesis 3.15, which we all know about. It's the mother promise. It's the proto-gospel. It's God's first indicator that he's going to fix everything that Adam and Eve just messed up. Um, and we know that promise. He's talking actually to the serpent, and he says, And there I will put enmity, hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall crush your head or bruise your head, and you shall um, uh, injure his heel. Um, and so there's going to be battle one day between, yes, between the offspring of Eve and the offspring of the serpent, meaning those who he influences to depart from God and all that. But when the final battle happens, when the big battle happens, it's between the offspring of Eve and Satan, the serpent himself. Because he doesn't say he's going to bruise your offspring's head. He says he's going to bruise your head. Okay? And remember, when we see the beast, we always want to think the dragon. You can't separate these two. As Mark was saying, the, the, the dragon is always working through the beast. 
And so at the cross, okay, at the cross, resurrection, and ascension, the, the, the lethal blow was struck. And just like um, the, the beasts in Daniel, who even once those kingdoms were, were ended, they were allowed to continue for a little while. This beast is going to continue to be active. He's going to continue to, to make war on the saints. He's going to continue to blaspheme God um, all the way up until the end. Yeah, and just so going along with that, I do think that the decisive wound clearly that Jesus inflicted is on the cross. There, there may also be a sense in which this passage is referring to the fact that there are times in which the leaders of these empires literally die, like Nero dies and mm-hmm. Vespasian and all these other ones die, and it looks like the empire's teetering on the edge of ruin. You know, how are we ever going to recover? How is Rome going to return to its previous glory? And yet, even though there are moments where it seems like it's going to collapse, it's received a mortal wound, inevitably someone somewhere rises up and continues the mantle of the beast. It may be a completely different world empire. You know, Assyria falls, but then Babylon rises. There's always a beast rising somewhere, taking back over, and people see the inevitability of the godless world powers are always out there. Whether it's in North Korea, whether it's with you know, Putin and Russia, wherever it is, we always see them around us. And so even if one seems to be mortally wounded, another one comes back at, to take its place. Yeah, and what's interesting here when it talks about, um, you know, it seems to have a mortal wound, and this mortal wound was healed. It talks about this again in, um, in verse 14, that, you know, talking about the image of the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. It's, it's actually, the, the language is the same as in Revelation 5 when John saw a lamb standing, the ESV says, as if slain, but it's literally just standing as slain. That's what he sees here with this beast. So this beast in some way is a, a mockery, a mockery of Jesus. He's trying to imitate Christ. He's trying to, to you know, say, look, I was dead, but now I'm, I'm back again. Um, and so we, we always have to understand that the, the beast's work in the world is always going to be try to, to try to take us away from Christ, to take our focus off Christ, to take our focus off the centrality of his cross, the centrality of his resurrection, ascension, and his return. Um, we're going to see that with the false prophet as well. They're, they're, they're always imitating, but it's a poor imitation if you know how to, how, how to, how to discern what's going on. Um, so that's why I wrote down here, I want to make sure I mention this, we need to beware of false Christs, false messiahs, who will parrot themselves as Christ, but in reality, they're just false and counterfeit. And this beast is going to try to act like he's Jesus almost. Um, and, and, and the world, who, whose names, as we'll see, aren't written in the Lamb's Book of Life, they're going to marvel and be like, wow, look at this dude. Um, we got to follow him. Let, let, me, let me pick up at verse 3 again. Let me reread part of this. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? So here we see, listen, do most of these people know that they are worshipping the dragon? Do they know that they are worshiping or following Satan? No, most of them do not know that. As far as they know, they're, just, they're being devoted to a totalitarian state or giving their, selling their soul out in some other way. They've compromised with Christ and they've given themselves to follow the beast. And unbeknownst to them, they're actually worshiping the dragon who has given his authority to the beast. Why do they do this? They say it at the end of verse 4. Who is like the beast and who can fight against it? Can, can I give you an example? Daniel 3. Nebuchadnezzar builds the golden statue. You've got to bow down to the state or we're going to kill you. Well, they're the most powerful government in the world. We can't, if we don't do it, we're dead. So if we want to survive economically, physically, in any kind of way, if we don't want our family to hurt the loss of a, of, a, of a mom or a dad because they're not bowing down, well, we better, I mean, who can resist the state? Who could possibly fight against this beast once it's turned against us? We've got to bow down. I, know, I don't really believe in this golden statue, but it's better to compromise for a moment and keep your family, keep your job, than to not compromise at all and risk losing everything. Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego risk losing everything. They're thrown in the fire, and God in that instance, preserves them miraculously, but he will raise us one day from the dead miraculously, no less miraculously. So just because the beast seems to be the winner, you can't resist. Well, no, at the end of the day, if we are faithful through persecution and even in the worst case martyrdom, God will be faithful to raise his own from the dead and not one of them will be lost or forgotten. Yeah, and the fact that Satan works through means like the beast and people worship the dragon um, even though they might not realize they're worshiping the dragon, that's not a new thought in the New Testament. 
Um, You don't have to turn there, but listen again to a very familiar passage, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. He says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following who? The prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, and so on. Now, the majority of us in here would probably say before I became a Christian, I was not a worshiper of the devil. I might not have given much thought to God or the things of God, and I might have actively, you know, I don't like Christianity, made fun of Christians, but you wouldn't say I'm a Satan worshiper. But in reality, all of us outside of Christ were um, in some sense or another. Um, and so again, we, we don't directly do that outside of Christ, but that's true of everyone. When we are in our sins, we are following Satan. He's our leader. Just saying here, following Satan in this sense, we, we have a cartoonish notion of that. Mm-hmm. We either have an exaggerated cartoonish notion of Satan, or we have sort of like the occultic version, like this really dark kind of wicked thing that everyone pretty much knows is bad. Satan... <laughs> Satan's tr- one of Satan's tricks is to make you think that's what he's like. He's mainly just that kind of stuff. The occultic stuff on the floor with the big pentagram and the blood and whatever. I mean, th- that's not, sa- that's, sure, that's satanic, but that's, that's just one of many forms. All Satan wants is for my heart to be more excited about anything than I am about Jesus. That's all he cares about. He doesn't care if it's your job. He doesn't care about if it's your family, your education, what you're doing at home, what you're doing at school, what you're doing on the internet. He just wants you to be more excited about something other than Jesus. And if you're doing that, you are following his desire for your life, which is to ignore Jesus and to worship anything else in creation. So it might look like loving money, and it might look like some occultic practice, but all of it would be doing what Satan wants us to do in in that sense. Yeah, um, and even further going, you know, thinking about um, this beast mimicking Christ in kind of a a wicked, perverted way, look at that last statement in verse 4, the, the world's asking this question, like, you know, in marveling and worship, who's like the beast? Who can fight against it? Some of these, the phraseology, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, should um, evoke some thoughts in your head. Again, he's mocking God. He's trying to produce um, in, the, in the hearts and minds of people who aren't believers this awe of the beast so they don't stand in awe of Christ. Uh, it's Exodus chapter, chapter 8, verse 10. I'm not going to ask you guys to turn to all of these because I've got it written down. But listen to this. This is, um, this is God speaking to Mo, or Moses said. He said, tomorrow, Moses said, be it as you say so, that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. Uh, Exodus chapter 15. This is after the, the Red Sea. Listen to this language from verses 11 and 12. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand and the earth swallowed them. You could look at uh, Psalm 35, 9 and 10, Psalm 86, 8, Psalm 113, 5 and 6, Isaiah 40, 18. Um, All of these places are like, who's like God who can do what he can do and is like he is? And so keep that in mind because again, the beast is always trying to give a pitiful imitation of God and of Jesus. Who was like the beast and who can fight against him? This is language reserved for God alone that people are now giving to the beast. You know the phrase, uh, and this phrase is slightly overstated, but you, you know what it means. All, all power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, it's only true if the person with the power is sinful, right? Jesus has all power and he's not corrupt because he's not, that, that's not true of him. Mm-hmm. But as far as us as human beings go, because we have a fallen nature, the more authority we have that is completely unchecked by anyone above us or around us, the more likely we are to use it for selfish and egotistical means. So think about this. Virtual, I mean, any human being who's not a believer, doesn't love the Lord, doesn't have God above them to keep their morality in check, anybody who doesn't believe in Jesus, all of us left to ourselves, given enough power without any checks and balances around us, will automatically begin at some point down the road to use the power self-centeredly and in a way that is evil and that hurts other people. And eventually we become the whole list of the names, Nebuchadnezzar, Hitler, Stalin, whoever it is. You give someone enough power and enough position, you end up thinking, I'm God. My will is absolute. I kill and I make alive. You know, I bring up and I cast down. Well, no, that's God's job. But, but th- that person with absolute power begins to play the role of God. It's inherently blasphemous. It's inherently a God Mm -hmm. replacement. It's inherently saying, 
I've got the power and I, I can do whatever I want. Whatever I declare is true. And just look at history. Any one man left with unchecked power, how does it go? Uh, generally speaking, if not almost every time, it goes very badly because it is used in a sinful and self-centered way. So it is with the beast and eventually with the final Antichrist figure. And I think we could say with that that like, you know, we, we have a reflex when we see people like a Hitler and people using their power in, in just horrible ways. You know, we say that's not, that's not even human. Like they're, they're acting beast like, like an animal. Well, we have biblical warrant to say they're acting like a beast. Uh, probably because that's the beast working in them, through them, Satan behind him, um, you know, doing that. And so it's totally accurate and good to say that evil in the world that the world celebrates is beastly. Roe v. Wade was, was, was beastly. It was not godly in any way. It was of the beast. It was of the dragon. And we shouldn't be, feel ashamed of saying that. It might really make some people mad when we do. But it's the truth. Like, humanity as created by God didn't have that in them. It's when we gave ourselves over to Satan and then Satan starts working that we start acting not like images of God, but like the beasts. And when we act like beasts, terrible, awful, horrible things take place. But jump, jumping in there, again, when, when a state becomes totalitarian in the sense they have mm -hmm. complete and absolute power, it tends... Just, just throughout history and in the Bible, it tends towards getting everyone to have uniform submission to their rule and reign, which means that does not go well for the Christian. The Christian should be the consummate and most wonderful um, member of society. We should be submissive to authorities at every point we can be. We should be kind. We should be respectful. We should be, my sermon today is on peacemaking. We should be pursuers of peace. But at the end of the day, the, the Christian cannot give a pinch of incense to Caesar, like the, the, the Christians, when Revelation was written, they said, if you, if you give a pinch of incense once a year to Caesar, you can go about your economics as you want, you can keep your job, everything's fine. Just once a year, pinch of incense devoted to Caesar as a god, you'll be fine. But the Christians go, we can submit to you in all kinds of ways, but when it comes to absolute submission to the state as a god, we we cannot do that. We don't say this disrespectfully. We just say we cannot do that. Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. And at that moment, that's when the world says you cannot be tolerated. We will not allow for that. You must have absolute submission to the state in every sense. And if you reserve anything for a higher Lord than the state, namely Jesus, that is the absolute you cannot go there. You, you cannot. And Totalitarian states always tend towards that. Absolute submission to their government, and that's why Christians were always going to be the odd men and women out, yeah. because we cannot, at the end of the day, give our total allegiance to the state as God. We say Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. Yes. And that's, that's what we can never say, Caesar is Lord. Um, Caesar, again, that's, we, we take that from an empire, but any, any leader, we can never say so-and-so, whether an individual or a small group of individuals, whatever, it's never Lord. Jesus alone is Lord. Um, and it seems like, it seems simple to say that, but that could cost you your head one day. Um, hopefully it won't, but it's a reality that we have to be aware of in the world we live in. And just as a, as a commercial for this fall, in this Sunday school, we're going to be talking about a lot of hot button cultural issues. We're calling it against the culture for the culture. We want to love the culture with truth, but we don't want to believe cultural lies. And so just one sneak preview of what we'll be talking about, one of the issues, you know, it would not surprise me if in this church, some people lose their job at some point in the future because we will say, I can't use the, the wrong gender pronouns. I, I, I can't go there. I, I, I cannot live by lies, to use mm -hmm. the title of the book. I, I cannot live by lies. I cannot say, if, if I have a biological woman in, my, in, in the office where I work, and she has now said that she's transitioned to be a he, and that I must call her a he, and if I don't do it in the email or in the conversation, I, my boss has already told me I could be fired. Well, yes, I'll avoid using the pronouns as much as I can. Just avoid pronouns. Just don't use them if you can. But if push comes to shove, if it has to be used, are we going to give a pinch of incense to Caesar or not? Mm -hmm. And it's going to be costly, I think, in the next decade, whether we give the pinch of incense or not. We, we have to say, listen, I love this individual. This, this woman is made in the image of God. I love her. I care about her. I want her to know Christ, and I will do anything sacrificially to help her with her physical needs and whatever may be going on. But I cannot say what I know not to be true. I cannot call her he, even if it hurts her her feelings, and even if it causes a, a problem at work, I will do it, I hope, with a humble disposition. But at the end of the day, I'm not giving the pinch of incense. I will not do it. And, and 
I think for some, it will be costly. Uh, maybe for some more than others, but I think for all of us in one way or another, uh, as, this, as this sort of tidal wave of the new religion is coming upon us, uh, which involves a whole mixture of things we'll talk about this fall, uh, we need to be ready and we need to be able to stand our ground with humility, but also with boldness at the same time. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, I, I want to get on that, but we need to, <laughs> I'm looking forward to that a whole lot. Um, let's move on. Uh, look at verse five and six. And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. There's that time period again that we've seen multiple times in chapters 11 and 12. Um, now here again in uh, chapter 13. And I think that's a reference to the same period of time that we saw in Daniel that we've seen here is a reference to the whole period of time between Christ's ascension to the right hand of God and his second coming in power and glory. Okay, the, the three and a half years is the, the second half of Daniel's 70th week. We are in it now and we will remain in it until Jesus comes back. That is the end point of it. And so this beast is going to be blaspheming for 42 months. Um, look at verse six. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God. I mean, this is bold. I mean, he, he's not hinting here. He's not, you know, indirectly doing this. He is challenging God. God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is those who dwell in heaven. And again, not, not to get too far off on that, but you think about blaspheming God. You know, we looked at what does that blasphemy mean? Speech that's slanderous towards God, denigrating, defaming, uh, speaking evil <coughs> against God. That means it's going to say things about God that it wants us to believe about God that are actually contrary to who God is. It's not just... Let's, let's all hate God. A lot of times it's going to be, hey, I want to change what you think about God. Did God I, really say? Did God really you say? You shall not die. Does God really hate this? Does God really call this sin? Um, you blaspheme God when you say something is sin that is not, you say something is not sinful that God said is sinful. That's blaspheming. You're slandering the character of God in that because you're saying what God said is, is, is rebellious and sinful and ungodly in his sight that deserves his judgment. No, it actually doesn't. That's blasphemy. That's in line with what we're seeing and, and here. Satan, Satan, he clearly is a blaspheming God. He hates God. But because Jesus is now in heaven and he is safe at this point from, from any kind of physical harm, Satan can no longer persecute Jesus bodily. Mm -hmm. So what does he do? He goes after his body on earth, right? Yep. That, when, when Saul was persecuting Christians and having them killed and put in jail, when he sees Jesus on the Damascus road, what does he say? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Say, Jesus is in heaven, but Satan's going after wh whoever he can get. And now it's the bride mm -hmm. of Christ on earth. Yeah, so um, he's uttering blasphemies against God. His name is dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. And then verse 7, it was, it's not actually allowed. It's the same phrase as it was given um, in the Greek. I don't know why they chose to say that here. It wasn't just permitted to do it. It was given to him. So this is a divine giving. God is sovereignly giving this ability um, to the beast for a limited amount of time. It was given to make war on the saints and conquer them, and authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. Um, I want us to hold our place real quick and turn back to Daniel chapter 7. We referenced this earlier. I want to look at verses 23 through 25. Um, the connection should be clear that this is that little horn, um, the one we talked about a lot when we talked about Daniel, but it's Daniel chapter 7. We're looking at this fourth beast, and we want to pay attention to what this beast does and the little horn or, um, yeah, what this horn does against the people, the, the saints of the Most High. It says, Thus he said, As for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms. It shall devour the whole earth, and trample it down, and break it to pieces. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones, and he shall put down three kings. And then look at verse 25. He shall speak words against the Most High. That's blasphemy. And he shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the law and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. For 42 months, three and a half years, um, 1260 60 days. And so, how long is the beast able to wage war on the saints? The entire time between the first and second comings of Christ. 
But his power is still limited to a degree. He cannot make total war and, and get it to the point where it seems like he has actually succeeded. Because remember in verse 11, the two witnesses, they have their, their time of, of prophesying, of, of preaching, being faithful witnesses. At the end of the 1260 days, the beast from the bottomless pit comes up, makes wars on them. He conquers them and kills them. So he's making war in a general sense the entire time, but his ability to completely overwhelm uh, the people of God is still limited up until this point. At the end, as we know, there will be this increase of activity. Satan will be unrestricted to do whatever he wants. Um, and that's when the beast will be given just this raw ability to unite the world against Christ and against his people. And that's when chapter 11, when it says that they... Um, he rose from the pit, made war on them, conquered them, killed them. Their dead bodies lied in the street of the great city. Um, three and a half days, some of the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze and they'll rejoice. The world will be celebrating with the beast um, when he eventually is able to conquer the saints. And you think about it, guys, of all the religions and of all the, the if you just want to put it this way, ways of viewing the world that is the most odious to our current culture, not just here in the U.S., but in the Western world, it's Christianity. It's Christianity, and it's not liberal Christianity. It's conservative, Bible-believing Christianity. They, why, why do you think when the Obergefell decision happened and the Supreme Court made that, that very ungodly choice to, to say that, um, homosexuals can marry. Why do you think they were so excited? Love wins. They were rejoicing because they'd stamped down that oppressive Christian view, that oppressive patriarchal Christian view that says men are men and women are women and only men and women can marry. Th that, that's in anticipation of, of their rejoicing uh, when the beast finally wins. So if you look at the screen here, uh, this has been making its round uh, on Twitter and some other places recently at some of these pro-choice rallies that have been going on the last couple weeks. They've had, uh, I, I don't know these couples in particular. I'm assuming they're Christians. I don't know that for sure. But there's a lot of Christian couples doing stuff like this where they'll show up at a pro-choice rally and they'll say, listen, please don't abort your child. We will adopt your baby. You can see multiple couples doing this. Well, this would be an example of, of real godliness, re real, real fruit mm -hmm. of, of, assuming these are all believers. I don't know how many of them are and aren't, but some of them are certainly Christian. Uh, seeing this real evidence of God's work in, in their lives, coming along saying, listen, we will, we will adopt your child. Please don't abort. Well, the response of the culture, I'm not trying to be cartoonish, although this is a cartoon response. You guys all know Luke Skywalker, right? You know Mark Hamill, the actor who plays Luke Skywalker? And he also has been the voice of Joker in the Batman animated series, which I've never really watched, but uh, there you go. He tweeted this, I think it was, what, yesterday? He plays the Joker, right? We will adopt your baby. This is July 2nd. 77,000 likes, 7,000 retweets, and he's saying, he's demonizing the Christians, He's saying, yeah, we'll, we'll adopt your baby into our cult. We'll adopt your baby into our ridiculous, bigoted Christianity. We, we will basically brainwash and destroy your child. We're, we're basically Joker and his girlfriend. We're, we're going to adopt your kids and ruin their lives. So Mark Hamill, Luke Skywalker, Luke, Mark, Mark Hamill is saying, better to kill the baby in the womb than to let a Christian adopt it and raise it. Is this evidence of the beast? Is this the way the beast talks? I'm not saying he is anything. I'm, I'm just saying this is one of a million manifestations of the, this kind of mindset, this kind of, in other words, it's not just that the world hates Christians when they fail and are hypocrites. Of course, the world loves that. But what this text is saying, look, look, look with me here, just so I can make my point. Look, look at verse 7. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. They act, the, the world actually dislikes the holiness of God's people. I'm talking the real thing. Like when, when you see people acting in a way that is, that is imitating of Christ, we will adopt your child. It's actually that that is being despised. Mm -hmm. It is actually that saying, no, like you, you absolutely, we will, not let you, uh, we will not let you do that. So, so let, let me jump in here to this next section. Look at verses 8 through, um, eight through 10. Now, this idea was not original to me, but I hope you find it interesting at the very least. Are you ready? I'm going to make an argument. I don't, use the, I, don't, I don't think I've hardly ever used the acronym for Calvinism, which is TULIP, T-U-L-I-P, before in my entire teaching at this church. But I'm about to mention TULIP right now because I think all five points of TULIP are in these three verses. Are you ready? Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. Why do I mention this here? Well, it's, it's in the text, but, but secondly, this is a comfort to us. 
In the midst of this chaos around us and this beast that's going to come trample on the saints, where's the comfort? Where's the hope? Well, Greg just mentioned, God has got a, a, a leash on the beast. It's, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a borrowed authority, and God's going to bring it back and judge the beast. So that's part of it is God's sovereignty. But listen to God's sovereignty and salvation. All five points of Calvinism are right here. Look at verse 8. We'll start with the total depravity, the T. Verse 8, and all who dwell on the, earth, on the earth will worship it, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. Now listen, total depravity means this, left to myself, I will always worship something other than Jesus. My free will is enslaved to my sinful nature, and I will always choose sin over Jesus left to myself. What does every single human do apart from God's intervention in this verse? They worship the beast and follow it. They worship what is ungodly. That's all of us by nature. So that that is total depravity. Number two, unconditional election. Look at verse eight. You can see it most clearly here. All who dwell on the earth worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who was slain. What makes the small few stay faithful to the lamb? The answer is God wrote their names in a book of life before they were born. It's not something I choose that got me in the book of life. It's God choosing to put my name by grace in his book that made me a Christian. His writing your name in the book before the creation of the world is the cause of your salvation, not not something he did in reaction to your salvation. He didn't wait until you were converted and write your name down. He wrote your name down, and that's why his grace has transformed your life. That's the doctrine of unconditional election. How about limited atonement, the most controversial of the five? And what we mean by that, I'll explain. Look look at verse 8 one more time. All who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. This text tells you explicitly who Jesus died with the intention of saving. It's everyone written in the Lamb's book of life. That's why he was slain, to ransom all those who are in the book of life. That's all of his elect, all of his sheep, all of his true bride, all of his people. Look at Revelation chapter 5 to make the same point. I think... This, this doctrine is taught right here. Let me, let me read 5, verses, uh, verse 9. Uh, Revelation 5, 9, the song in heaven. And they sang a new song saying to Jesus, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you've made them a kingdom of priests. It doesn't say he ransomed every tribe and language and people and nation. It says his blood was spilled to ransom people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. See, here's the thing. There's a sense in which the gospel is universal. God so loved the world, he gave his son, whoever believes will be saved. That's true. There's a sense in which the offer of the gospel is universal. But what guarantees the salvation of God's elect? The answer is Jesus died specifically to purchase his own from the world. From every tribe, his blood purchased them. That's the doctrine of limited atonement. Go back to Revelation 13. How about irresistible grace? Well, it's implied here. You can sort of see it in verse 9. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. God has to give you the hearing to hear it. He has to give you the eyes to see it. But most of all, you see here, if it wasn't for God writing my name in his book and dying, Jesus dying for my sins, I would still be worshiping the world, which means what made the turnaround in my life was God's redeeming grace. He irresistibly won me to himself. That's the doctrine of irresistible grace. How about the doctrine of perseverance of the saints, the fifth point of tulip, the P. Look at verse 10, it's right there. If anyone is to be taken captive to to captivity, he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. Here is a call for the endurance or the perseverance and faith of the saints. Perseverance of the saints means two things. Number one, God is going to keep us. He keeps his own. My sheep hear my voice, they follow me, I know them, they know me, I I hold them in my hand and no one can snatch them out of my hand. And my Father, who's greater than all, holds them in his hand and no one can snatch them from my Father. We believe in eternal security. That doesn't mean we are passive in our salvation. We don't just sit back and just let things happen. No, we must also use our will that God is empowering by his spirit to endure, to persevere, to keep going. And so you see here again, the endurance or perseverance of the saints is also included in this verse. Why do I bring all that up? Well, I think it's in the text, but also this is a wonderful doctrine, not just for Christians to argue about, and it's fine to argue about this in a loving way. It's fine to debate this. That's that's not a problem. Just don't lose your temper, but it's good to discuss these things. But here's why it's wonderful news. If those five doctrines are true, no matter what comes your way, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
You were depraved and in love with sin. God chose you before you were born. He sent Jesus to die specifically to secure your salvation in the Lamb's book of life. He then sent his spirit to defeat your rebellion, change your will, give you a new heart, make you devoted to him uh, truly from your heart. And he's also promised that he's never gonna let you ultimately fall away. If the five points of tulip are true, you've got nothing to fear even if we live to see the worst moment of the beast and the Antichrist. Even if we live through the highest moment of persecution in all of church history, God will not lose his own. He won't lose one sheep. All of them will be rescued by the redeeming and saving work of God. So the sovereignty of God is what we need, especially when things are getting difficult and when things get tough. Amen. I can't add to that. That's good stuff. <laughs> do we want to try to do 11 through 18? Well, we Brief. can start it, and start if it. next week we can finish it if we don't get there. All right. Um, all right, I'll read um, 11. Um, let's just read 11 through 14 and see, what, see how far we get. It said, I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the whole earth or dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Um, a couple of thoughts here. Just verse 11. Um, you know, we talked about the, the first beast imitating Christ, trying to, you know, in some ways, like take the place of Christ. This second beast is also called the false prophet. Um, and so he's kind of like the, the fountainhead of, of all false religion, uh, if you want to put it that way. But look at how he's described. It had two horns like a what? Like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. So this beast comes trying to look like Jesus, okay? And so this is why it is so important that we are discerning, that we know the word well. Because if we, and, and in our generation, this is even more of a temptation because we are so visually oriented with, with social media, with movies, with TV, everything is so visually oriented. We are so, like our emotions, our responses is all driven by what we see. We have to develop the ability to listen to what's being said, regardless of how flashy it, the things are that we're seeing um, because this beast is going to do everything it can to make you think, oh, this is what Jesus is like. This is, this is like Jesus. And we have to have the ability to discern what it's actually saying. And if we get that ability, we will be able to say, no, that's act you might look a little bit like Jesus, but you're actually speaking with the voice of Satan because the drag, it says it speaks spoke like a dragon. Well, what, what's the only other dragon we've encountered in Revelation? It's Satan. It's the dragon. He, 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 he actually sounds like Satan. I mean, think about Jesus in the, the wilderness. What does Satan do? He uses scripture to try to lead Jesus away. And that's why I say like this, this isn't just saying that because I'm a pastor and I'm supposed to say that. Like our ability to discern right from wrong is going to hinge on how well we know God's word. We have to be able to have a, a, a basic enough grasp of, of the key doctrines and key teachings of Scripture so that when Satan comes all dressed up trying to look like Jesus, we can say, I don't care how good you look. You don't sound like my Jesus, and I'm not going to listen to you because you're speaking like the dragon. Yeah, so we got to wrap up here, but just say there's two beasts in this chapter. One comes from the water, which is the place that the, 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 the the source of evil. This one comes from the land, which probably is a way of trying to make it look better than the other one. Like, it's mm -hmm. a different, so it looks like a different source, but it's really the same. But, but put it this way. The first beast that we've been looking at, that is the power of the coercive state. Like Nebuchadnezzar, bow down or you're going to be in the fl flaming furnace. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, That's the power of the coercive state is the first beast in, in Revelation 13, verses 1 to 10. The second beast from the land, that's the power of deceptive false religion. So do you see how these two work in tandem? One is coercive state power. One is deceptive false religion. These two things work together to try to back up Satan's plans here on the earth. So we gotta, we got to wrap up here. Uh, Greg, can you close us in prayer? Yeah, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and I pray, Lord, that all that we've considered for these few moments will 
Lord, bear fruit in our lives, God, that we would be wise to what is going on in the world, what is behind the scenes at work to lead us away from you and to lead the world astray. But God, I am so thankful that my name has been written in the book of life of the lamb that was slain and it was written there before the foundation of the world. That is the hope of every single one of us who have believed in Jesus. God, we know that you have already recorded us in your book and we are safe and secure because of that. And I pray, Lord, that we would be strengthened, we would be encouraged um, to, to live all the more for Jesus because we know uh, that we are secure, that our eternity is secure and that even if we were to die, we still conquer um, because we're faithful unto death. And I pray, Lord, that each one of us would be, that we would so be gripped by the gospel and gripped by your truth, Lord, that no matter what comes, Lord, we would hold on to Christ and we'd hold on to the truth, even to the very end. And Lord, especially help us not to be deceived. Um, Satan himself, Jesus said, will be transformed as an angel of light to deceive, if possible, even the elect. And so, Lord, help us be discerning. Lord, help us be discerning so that we prove ourselves to be one of yours. Um, Equip us as a church. Help us labor for this, Lord. Um, And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you all again for being here today. We will plan to finish chapter 13 next Sunday. And then we'll be dealing with the seals, uh, the seven seals, I believe, the Sunday after that. Thank you.